Today we have um, another great guest speaker in a different industry that uh, we often see here, uh, and that's the uh, insurance industry. Um, and that's uh, Mr. Mike McGavick, uh, who since 2008 has served as the Chief Executive Officer of XL Group PLC, the parent company of the XL Caitlin Insurance and Reinsurance Companies. XL Group has nearly $60 billion in assets, with total revenues last year in excess of, 10, of $9 billion. Mike also serves as the chairman of the Geneva Association and is a director and immediate past chairman of the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers. He is on the board of the Global Reinsurance Forum, the American Insurance Association, the Insurance Information Institute, and the International Insurance Society. From 2001 to 2005, he was the chairman, president, and CEO of Safeco Corporation. Prior to joining Safeco, he spent six years with CNA Financial Corporation, where he held various senior positions, including president and CEO of the company's largest commercial insurance unit. Mike is involved in a number of industry, political, public affairs, and community service activities. He was the founding chairperson of the Business Partnership for Early Learning and is also on the board of Landessa, a nonprofit organization that helps the rural poor around the globe obtain land rights. He was named the Puget Sound Business Journal's Executive of the Year in 2003 and was the 2005 winner of the prestigious Charles E. Odegaard Award for his efforts in promoting diversity at the University of Washington. He was a former Chief of Staff in the United States Senate. That's not something you come across every day. And more interestingly, he actually ran for the Senate in 2006 for the state of Washington. He has received numerous recognitions for his leadership within the, indus within the insurance industry Include among others are Insurance Day's Industry Achiever of the Year, Insurance Leader of the Year by St. John's University School of Risk Management, one of the top 100 game changers in the last 100 years of the insurance industry by Leaders Edge, the Bermuda Insurance Institute's Reinsurance Person of the Year, the Review Magazine's Industry Personality of the Year, and Reaction Magazine's Insurance CEO of the Year. Mike is also the founding member of the Washington, D.C.-based Wild Geese Old Boys Rugby Club. So I don't know if this is a theme here, but that's the second CEO in a row who likes to hit people. So maybe this is their stress relief. Um, he's also a Notre Dame dad, and his son Patrick is a sophomore here at Notre Dame, so some of you may know him. But anyways, let's extend a warm welcome to Mr. Mike McGavick. Thank you very much. I really have only two big concepts that I want to share with you. In fact, if life was fair, those of you with the blue cards who are just here to get credit would be done in about 10 minutes. And they're very simple ideas, but I think they're the kind of the culmination of what I've been learning along the rather varied journey that was just described. One of them has to do with leadership. You might think I'd want to talk about leadership with a group like this, because I'm well aware that a huge mission here at Mendoza is to put leaders into the world who have a high ethical core and who understand what business is really all about. And the second is about how groups, any kind of group, becomes the best at what they do in a competitive field. A bit of a formula, if you will, for outperformance and success. So those are the two big concepts I want to share. Let me get right into those. Number one, about leadership. I think there are four really big ideas as I've watched leaders and as I've tried to become a better leader myself that really distinguish those who are gifted. Number one, they realize that leadership is in service of others, full stop. That the most important aspect of leadership is helping others to succeed. <coughs> Number two, anyone can lead any day, any situation, in any group, as long as they understand point number one. As long as they don't understand that it's not about themselves, they can raise their hand and they can take leadership at any moment where they can help the group do better. Number three, the bedrock, the foundation that creates enduring leadership is your ethical character and the authenticity with which you display it every day. And while people can run a long ways without it, 
In the end, they will get caught out. In the end, that is the foundation of enduring leadership. And then fourth, I believe that the most underestimated and most poorly taught aspect of effective leadership is communication. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's got to be able to get in front of a group and speak and song and dance and all that, but you have to find your way of effective communication. Because if you can't get your idea from your head and your heart authentically and ethically to somebody else, how are they going to know where to go? So those are four simple thoughts about leadership. And as I go through the rest of this, I'll try to show some little stories of where those come to life, okay? That second big concept, how do outperforming groups occur? What is it that makes them distinguished from the other competitors? I firmly believe here there are three ideas. Number one, they go together, how the strategy of the company fits with the culture of the company and fits with the people of the company. When those three ideas are deeply and well thought out, strategy, culture, and people, they form a self-reinforcing alignment that causes better and better excellence all the time. Of those three, by the way, most people like to talk about strategy the most. I would tell you for certain that culture is the hardest and most important of the three to get right. So for the blue cards, I think you're done. <laughs> now, <clears throat> a little bit about this. You know, the rest of what I'm going to talk about are just some stories that I think reinforce those ideas. And some of you are going to help me tell those stories with that little prayer that uh, was handed out at the opening. And then we'll go to Q&A. Now, before I get into the meat of it, though, I want to give a little bit of context. So, so three things. You know, like any... Uh, intelligent preparer for a presentation, I thought a lot about the audience I'd be in front of. You know, and I have to say, it was interesting, right, because it's a bit of a mixed audience. A fair number of you here because it's class and credit, I get that, sorry. Um, but for some of you, you chose to be here. You might have come here because the Mendoza School has a tremendous reputation and you wanted to be a part of one of their things because you thought it'd be useful. You're someone who wants to better themselves and you're trying to just get better at your contribution to the world, you thought this might help. Uh, or third, historically, you've heard that there's pretty good speakers. Now, on that third one, I'm really sorry. You know, I feel like you've been misled. No one in this room is praying more fervently that either Tim Cook or Condoleezza Rice or Jamie Dimon is going to take over any second now, and it'll be great. Until then, you're going to have to put up with me. The second thing I thought about in terms of context is anybody who listened to that nice introduction, and thank you very much, I gave you very meager material and you made it a big deal. Um, the, you notice there's a theme in there, right? You've seen two careers, right? I spent the first entire chunk of my career in politics and public life one way or another. And then the second in insurance and reinsurance. Now that's got to give rise to a couple of thoughts. First of all, if you think about the esteem in which a job is held, I'm working at the bottom of the gene pool, right? Politics, insurance, I'm going to do used cars next, you know? It's just, because in reality, those are not professions that generally the public, particularly in this election year, holds in very high regard. So I'm, I'm conscious of this notion. In fact, I'll, I'll mention something about it later. The second thing you'll notice is I've had a lot of jobs, or said another way, I've had trouble holding a job. So, you know, it's just a different kind of background. The advantage in what I'm going to talk about, and including for Q&A as you think about things you might want to discuss, is I've kind of been in a lot of different situations. And I think that's been helpful to me. Maybe it, in turn, can be helpful to you. Uh, the third thing is, I will tell you, this is one of the more intimidating uh, settings in which I've spoken. And uh, that may be a little counterintuitive, but it should be kind of obvious. Number one, this is, the, by many accounts, the top business school in the country. Now, by definition, if you're a student here, you therefore are among the best in the world. Well, that makes for a rather intimidating audience all by itself. And then second, there's two participants in this audience that are particularly intimidating to me personally. My wife, Gaylin, my wife, Gaylin, is a graduate of this fine school. In fact, she was one of those pioneering women when they had to go up three flights of stairs to find a women's bathroom, you know. 
So Gaylin uh, is an alum. She is, of course, my soulmate, but also she is my most harsh critic. So to speak, in fact, I can see the husband's all nodding. This is a little intimidating today. And then you heard from the introduction that my son Gates, we, we, are, we find him to be just a magnificent blessing. It's just so incredible to us that he got into Notre Dame, but, and moreover, that he was gonna wake up in time to see this. So uh, somewhere Gates is around. Makes it intimidating to have family uh, in the audience. But I wanna get back to the substance. Now, here we're gonna do a little audience participation. Um, when I ran for the Senate, as was referenced, I'll never forget there was an article describing my voice as a, rice, a raspy Irish falsetto. I don't think it was meant as a compliment, and so I'm gonna relieve the audience for a moment, you guys are gonna help, but we're gonna work from that Benedictine prayer that you have. A little bit about this. This was given to me by one of my colleagues at work. Emailed to me, uh, essentially in the, in the form you uh, find it, and uh, she said in her email, Mike, you must have read this because I think you get this, and in any case, I hope it reinforces you in your work. I found that an amazing act. And I printed it off and I put it on my credenza there and I just left it there. And every once in a while I'd notice it, read it again and reflect on what it meant. And as I was preparing for this presentation, it happened that I was packing up that credenza and came across this piece of paper. I took that as a sign, not being stupid. I thought, well, I better work from this. So I need a volunteer, I need someone who's willing to relieve the audience of my voice and loudly and slowly read that first sentence from that prayer. Will someone, uh, thank you. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deep within your heart. That was read like the best lecture you ever had at Mass, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> thank you very much. You know, the, uh, the reason I like this particular lesson relates to another lesson that I want to share with you that was given to me by one of the people I worked most closely in my life. It was a guy named Slade Gordon. He was a three-term United States Senator, a three-term Washington State Attorney General, argued 14 cases in front of the Supreme Court. He lived and is living a rather magnificent life. I was his driver in his first campaign for the United States Senate. First job I had to wear a tie for, you know? And I'll never forget my payoff for that job, because it was a horrible job. Back then, no candidates flew around like they do today, and Washington State's a big place, so I would drive all night to get him from one event to the next, and so on. And my job was to shut up, because he was reading or thinking or sleeping. And I, the payoff was I, was, I knew at some moment he'd want to talk, and I just planned and planned, what was the question I would ask him? that might help me understand why he's been so successful, how he thinks about success. One night it finally happened, he woke up in the middle of a long six hour drive, middle of the night, and he clearly wanted to talk. We were chatting and I screwed up my courage and I finally asked the question I'd been saving up. I said, Senator, or at that time I said Slade, but inappropriately. Slade, what, what have you observed is the real difference between the most successful people you've seen, you've seen Supreme Court judges, and presidents, and you know, the most successful people and the other folks. What, what do you think it is? I could tell this surprised him because he didn't answer right away. He's one of those guys who's so smart he finishes your sentences for you. And he thought about it for a little while and he said the following two things, and I have remembered this with precision ever since, and this was in 1980 that this took place. He said, I think two things. Number one, whenever you're confronted with an interesting problem, it can be whatever challenge it is, you have to have the willingness to think really deeply. And he said, now I know what you're thinking. You think you do that already. He said, you don't. Most people don't. Most, there's a lot of people who just can't. He said, when you're confronted with something challenging, you have to think about it so deeply that you not only think about it until it fits with what you believed before, which is what most people do, they stop right then. As soon as it fits a box, they just stick it there and I'm done, right? I've seen this before, figured it out, done. He says, no, no, you have to use that opportunity to think very deeply about whether you should challenge your own assumptions. You've gotta go and go and go until you find bedrock. 
And he said the most successful, the people who really make a difference in history were people who were willing to do that. And most of us just aren't. It's too hard. It's too difficult to challenge your own suppositions. We just stop where it gets comfortable. Seen it, done it, file it. But then he said something interesting and very out of character. He's a New England guy, kind of a you know, stiff dude. He's, he doesn't use a lot. I, I think he's hugged me once, you know, and I know he loves me like a son. He just I didn't hug his son. I mean, he's just that way, you know. And he said, number two is only work in your life on things that bring you joy. And my reason for number two is that's the only way you'll have the energy and courage to do number one over and over and over. Find something that gives you joy. Now, when I think about putting that idea to work, what you see in that uh, blessing, that idea of uncomfortable truths, and that idea that Slade gave me, that you've got to work and challenge and challenge, I think of that prescription, that formula I gave you a moment ago for outperformance in companies. How do you richly make sure that the strategy and the culture and the people are in a self-reinforcing alignment? Well, let's think about what each of those words mean, right? So what's strategy? You can give me the textbook definition, I'll give you mine. Strategy is I'm in competition, I have some things I'm unnaturally good at, I'm a little better than this than you are, and I'm gonna drive that advantage to get more customers, get more points, get well, whatever it is. Comparative advantage, what is it I do better than somebody else? And let's remember, and I think this is critical to say in any business school setting, business is really, really simple. It can get real complicated, but it is at heart very simple, isn't it? What is a business? I am doing something for somebody else that they will knowingly pay me more than it costs me to do. It's all a business is. I'm doing something for someone else that they value enough they will knowingly pay me more than it costs me to do. Well, if the strategy then is, how do I do it that little bit differently? that I can replicate and repeat and others can't do as well as I can? What is it that's different about what I do, whether it's selling insurance or anything else? Then what is culture? And I said before, this is the hardest, but by far we spend more time in our leadership group working on culture than anything else. So let me give a definition to culture. I've, none of these are invented by me, by the way. I'm repeating a lot of stuff I've learned over a lot of years. Culture. Culture is what's in the air that tells you what to do when no one is there to tell you what to do. It is the collective behaviors you observe around you that you replicate and the boundaries established by those behaviors that you would never pass. That's what a culture is. We can think of it in our religion, we can think of it in our country, we can think of it in our family. Every group of humans has a culture, a set of you can go there, you can't go there, acceptable, unacceptable, I work hard, I sleep hard, whatever it is, there are things you are replicating. Often they're not written down, often they're not intentional, but every group has a culture, and the best organizations are deeply deliberate about the culture they want to have. They think about the leadership behaviors they want, they think about the replica, they think about the boundaries, and they drive it, and they drive it, and they drive it. But notice I've said, that strategy and that culture have to match each other. And then the people. Some people do better in some environments than others, right? So in the end, you can't get this thing reinforcing itself where everybody just follows it, unless the, clear, the strategy is clear and everyone understands it, unless the culture is deeply intentional and constantly reflected in the behaviors of leaders and everyone in the place, and then you have people who are actually equipped to work in that strategy, work in that culture, who are comfortable um, and have the right background to serve the strategy. If you get those three things, you'll win all the time. And I can give you examples in football teams, not here right now. I can give you examples, I can give you examples in corporations, I can give you examples in community clubs, I can give you examples in governments. That formula works over and over and over. That's what we think hardest about. When I talk about a work environment where we go past our prior assumptions, we challenge ourselves at the company I work at as leaders every day. How do we do that? Are we doing it? Can we do it better, faster, 
That's all we think about. Now, XL Catlin, the company I work at, insurance and reinsurance, you probably wouldn't have heard of it. We do big, complex global risk. We're the largest operation at Lloyd's, for example, where they famously insured Betty Grable's legs and all this nonsense. When you see a, a satellite blow up, our company lost money. That's the kind of stuff we do. There, there's a very prominent monument. I can't name clients, but there's a very prominent monument in Europe. We insure it against terrorism. I still can't figure out how, but we do. So, you know, as a result, our strategy is about highly intensively complex things. As a result, we have to have a workforce comprised of really wicked smart people all over the place. And they love their job. This is cool stuff. This isn't, you know, vanilla insurance. This is unbelievably complicated and cool. But as a result of having really smart people and a strategy that's differentiating around innovation, we have to have a culture where people are extremely disciplined about the risks they take. Because we don't have enough people to watch the people to watch the people, and really smart people won't work in that environment, right? Smart people want to be entrepreneurial and hypo self-starting and all that. They won't work in a place where everybody checks the checks, the checks, the checks, right? So we can't control them that way. Our biggest defense against somebody in our organization doing something stupid is the culture we have for collaboration, for cross-checking. We're also global because complex risks are inherently global. This implies things about our strategy, about our culture. We're very inclusive. We, you know, all of this fits together. So think deeply. Be willing to think deeply. Find out what's important to think deeply about and challenge yourself, those next to you, to go on that journey with you. And you better be soon, you certainly find rewarding and fun or you just won't do it. So that brings us to our second line. Can I get another volunteer? School full of leaders, come on. Just to read the second line. No. Sir. May God bless you with holy anger and injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, It's a tall task. <laughs> Thank you very much for reading that. You know, I, I, you know, injustice we tend to think of as the business of the of the governments and the NGOs and that stuff. Yeah, that's how we tend to think of it. That's their job. We're in business. I just want to assure you that if you have a social conscious business, is still a very good place to be. Because we get to do real things too. Let me give you a simple example of where that's living for us right now. Ironically, it's a source of competitive advantage, but I'm embarrassed to say that. At our company, we have a huge drive, and this was true of the company I led before as well, around diversity and inclusion, particularly gender diversity. Our industry stinks at gender diversity. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So we believe we get a competitive advantage by attracting and retaining and having more women in leadership and various posts throughout the company. Isn't that pathetic? We win by reflecting the world. Isn't that a goofy idea? Well, you can take this, though, further, and you should. You know, th this involves a little bit of a story, but when I came into the business world, I was stunned. So I'd spent that first 20 years, really, in politics, public life. And here's a little secret. If you were working in political campaigns in the 80s, all of the important campaigns were run by women. All of them. Now, why was that? Back then, running political campaigns was not a very highly thought of profession. And generally, it was, was led by volunteers. And in those days, generally speaking, men were off making money or whatever, and the women had some opportunity, if they wanted to, to volunteer and they wound up running political campaigns. So when I first worked in political campaigns, all of my bosses were women. I thought that was normal. Helen Rasmussen and Rita Jean Butterworth, and they, you know, these people were amazingly gifted people, amazingly gifted people. I finally work in corporate life. That doesn't happen until the 90s, right? So 15, 20 years later. And I'll never forget, I walked into the first senior meeting, I was at, there wasn't a woman in the room. I literally wanted to ask, where the heck are all the women? And the answer was, they weren't thought of as a participant in corporate life. It was just ridiculous. So we set out at Safeco when I was leading there to change that. So we made some simple rules. How's this for a dumb, simple rule? I hope you'll adopt it, whatever organization you lead. 
Every time there's an open position, you have to prove, the hiring manager has to prove that they looked at a diverse slate of candidates. Has to prove it, document it. Once they've done that, hire the best person. Now, there's a little kicker. If it's close, pick the diversity candidate. Now, why do we add that kicker? Not just because it's good to do and healthy to do, but because in reality, hiring is like jumping off a cliff. You never know really how good the person is. You've barely met them, right? So if you're going to take a risk, why not take a risk to something that helps the place and that helps the society? And moreover, it's almost certain that the person who is not like you, in order to get close in your estimation, needs a little help to get you to make the choice because you're generally going to pick someone like you because it's more comfortable. So we get over that bias, that little hidden bias with that little kicker. Now, I was really happy that the companies I was involved in were doing something like that until I got radicalized. I got angry, as this, as this prayer says. I was over in London. We had just bought a big company there, four billion bucks to our shareholders to buy this company. And I'm about to speak to what they, a room just like this, but a smaller stage. I was about to speak to who they consider the future leaders of insurance in London, the most complex insurance marketplace in the world. So this is the leaders of insurance for the world. This is their future leaders. And I was downstairs, somebody else was speaking, and I poked my head around just to see what the audience looked like. Did they have fangs? Were they mean? You know, any guns in the room? And, and I'll never forget, I looked up and I was dumbstruck. So these are people in their 20s, right? From all the companies, best of the best. And I literally started counting. So there were rows like this. One woman, one woman. I was to the point in the United States where I thought it was literally illegal to have that many white males in one place. <laughs> and I got so ticked off that I threw out what I was going to say. And I got out there and gave a big talk about diversity and inclusion. I'll never forget one. <laughs> One young guy, you know, because that's pretty much all there was. At the end, he raised his hand. He says, so I guess I'm not getting a job at XL Catlin, huh? And I said, dude, you already won the lottery. What are you worried about? I mean, seriously? Do your best. You'll be fine. And that radicalized me. We've stopped making it just about a competitive advantage for our company. We've now engaged in programs that try and span the whole industry to change the whole sector. I don't really like doing that, but I figured the other guys can't catch up, catch up to us anyway, so why the hell not tell everybody else? But we are driven to change the sector. Driven, driven, driven. All forms of diversity, but gender first, because it's pathetic. Now, tell me that we aren't helping change the world, because I know dang well we are. And that's not a government job, that's a corporate job. I find that pretty cool. You can make a difference wherever you are. Remember that point I made about leadership? Wherever you are. No one asked me to help with diversity. We just did. I have no title for it. We're just doing it. No permission granted, just taken. Every one of you can do that in any group you're in, as long as you're sincerely and authentically trying to make that group more successful. They will love you for it. Who volunteers for the third line? Thank you, right over here. Thank you very much. You know, I, I, as an insurance person, you might see this as fairly literal. You know, insurance is constantly belittled, right? You know, why? Well, look, most of us, our entire interaction to insurance is what? We're forced to buy it. Because the bank forces you to, the law requires you to, it's usually an auto insurance policy. You're pretty sure you're never going to be in an accident, so why are you paying all this money? House is never going to burn down, why are you paying all this money? You get a contract for it that's in paper, right? And is made up the most complex legally gobbledygook you ever saw. And you're pretty sure the deck in that piece of paper is stacked against you. If I ever make a claim, they'll probably find something that says I can deny it. This is most of the world. I can see people smiling. This is how most people think of insurance. How do I think about insurance? Pretty simple. When we take on a risk for Apple, for example, we allow their balance sheet and their mental energy to focus on what they do for the world. 
So we literally liberate capital and mind share of the world's greatest companies to do what it is they do even better, even faster. And then when something does go wrong, we take that reading and we go to work restoring what was lost. I find that pretty meaningful work. But it fits with that larger lesson of finding things which bring you joy. My oldest son, Jack, he's a teacher. He's a teacher in the inner city down in, in Austin, Texas. He has a knack for cool communities. He lived in Seattle, too. You know, he's pretty good at this. But he's down in Austin, teaches in the inner city. I'll never forget when he told me he was going to be a teacher. You have to stand. This is a kid who didn't get a B in any class until he was a junior at the University of Virginia. Straight A's, everything he ever touched. And he sat down with me and said, Dad, I want to be a teacher. I said, son, that's an awesome profession, but I have to tell you the parable of the faiths, or the parable of the gifts. You've been given great talents, son. You are gifted. You could be a brain surgeon. You could get cancer. You, could, you have to tell me why that's the calling that uses these gifts you've been given most fully. I'll never forget as long as I live. He turned to me and said, Dad, I think you don't understand yourself and you don't understand me. You, for some strange reason, need to do things at scale. You want to change the world. I want to change one heart at a time. I think I'm really good at that. How cool is that? But he was right about what I want to do, too. I want to be involved in things that are really complicated and messy and big. And I want to help cause what that promise is when we make an insurance contract, that we'll make it right when it goes wrong. That we'll devise solutions that no one else has ever seen. It's cool work. It's complicated work. It's hard work. And people do laugh at you at cocktail parties, and I'm fine with that. Because I'm doing what brings me joy. That's what you should do, too. Then that final line, who will take that one on? Please. That one just speaks for itself so beautifully, doesn't it? I love that it's considered foolishness because that's a playful word. You know, work should be fun, by the way. One of the things I think is extremely perverse, and thank you very much for doing that. One of the things I find extremely perverse is the fact, if you just looked at it logically, think about how much time you'd like to spend with friends and family and how much time people spend at their jobs. Doesn't it seem really screwed up? Not enough time with friends and family and too much time at work. Well, if that's true, and it's true in every company I know of, shouldn't it be fun to be there? Shouldn't you be working on important, joyful stuff? Shouldn't the culture encourage that? But this idea, too, of foolishness and of leadership, again, I go back to where I started about the characteristics of great leadership. In service of others, Hollywood and the culture celebrate that lone visionary leader. Leaders are useless unless there are followers working together. Useless. Trust is the essence of followership. And why is it? It's deeply and primal for humans. We're in groups, we're in societies for safety. That's why we do it. Some of you are undoubtedly studying that. Well, I'm not going to be safe if the leader is all about him or herself and not about the group's success. I have to create that trusted link to leadership. And you can do it from anywhere. I've talked about that already. <laughs> Anyone can lead any moment, any time. With ethics and authenticity as your bedrock. And learning how to communicate and share so that people can be powerfully touched by the ideas and the thoughts and leadership you have. I hope this has been useful to you. To me, it's a bit of a foolish errand to try to be in such an august assembly. But I really believe that if people take these ideas to heart, you'll have all the success you can handle. And more importantly, you'll touch more hearts than you can believe. With that, I'm done. The next part of audience participation is yours. Any questions, any comments that you might have, I'd be happy to answer.
And by the way, an advantage of my varied background is I don't care if it's on business, politics. Well, politics isn't very much fun these days, but business and whatever topic you got, I'm happy with. So what in my uh, political background has helped me in my corporate life? It's a really easy one. Um, in, in, in the old days of campaigns, everybody who was working in them was volunteers. And so you, didn't, you couldn't control their behavior by financial incentives, which you usually do in a company setting, right? So you just had to really get that person excited and make them feel part of something larger than themselves. And it's all about motivation. And I've found that in a corporate setting, if you continue to believe that the most important thing to help people get energized about work is a sense of purpose and belonging, and realize that the salary and incentives and stuff is secondary, it's just another tool, that's a heck of an advantage. And many corporations, they, don't, they could no more get their head around their colleagues being volunteers being there. They think they're paid to go do their job, go do your job. That's the wrong mentality. So that's the biggest thing. Yes. Uh, name one political leader and one business leader that you admire for their leadership. Oh, uh, business leader. Um, it's hard to pick any one individual because, you know, we always learn so much about them and then we learn the good and the bad. Like, who doesn't admire Steve Jobs, right? But he was, a, he was mean to his people. I still can't get my head around that. He had to be so good at some things to overcome that weakness, right? So I don't want to associate myself with an abusive leader, but can't help but admire the sense of vision and dedication, and drive, purpose, you know. Um, on the political side, I mean, you know, I, I've been around a lot of politicians, and the closer you get to something, you know, it doesn't help. Um, uh, historically, Teddy Roosevelt, by far, uh, he, he completely confounded his own, his own assumptions. He challenged them deeply and richly and succeeded, and that was pretty cool. Uh, Reagan made the biggest difference of a president in my lifetime, but, you know, he had his own peculiarities. So it, it's hard. It's really hard, but there's, there's a lot of great people to learn from, but I never thought of a particular role model in either case, but that's the best I can do, sorry. Yes? Yeah, so the, the question and the observation is, look, we're doing a better job in recruiting women and diversity into different settings, but we're not doing as good a job at retaining. And we're losing people quickly. You mentioned STEM as an example. And what can we do about that? This is a huge part of the work we're doing right now. Um, let me give you some examples. <clears throat> the, the first thing that, that you have to understand, that I think companies have to more richly understand, is that while all people aspire to make a difference, um, people uh, have different views of their responsibilities at different points in life, men and women. And, and you have to find a design of your corporation that doesn't penalize people for making multiple choices, not just the straight ahead choice in terms of what the company wants from you. So we have been radically rethinking, um, particularly when, and we, by the way, our, our company and our, in our industry have the exact same thing. In our company, half of our new entrants, about 52% are women in all, across the whole company. And as you, if you go through the progression of jobs all the way you know, to the board or whatever, it literally it, it, it decreases by about 10% at each one. And then when you get to middle management, it falls off the table. And it becomes like, you know, I don't know, 80, 20 men. And then interestingly in our company, but this is something I'm, we're actually 50, 50 at the senior table. Uh, the board's about 30%, which is good, but not good enough. So we have it good at two ends of the barbell, but right there's that choke point. And most people very simplistically look at it and say, oh, well, those are the childbearing years. Really? Do we really think that simply about this problem? Let me tell you, I've met an incredible number of women who hit the childbearing years and powered right through because either that it just mattered to them differently, or more importantly, the place they worked understood that those were admirable twin vocations and accommodated that in a way that made it exciting to continue to be a part of the company. And I gotta tell you, the policies that are legally required are completely insufficient to that idea. 
You have to get your head around much more flexible work engagement. You have to get your head around how the husband's going to be a part of that sequence so that we're no longer saying one does one and one does the other. We, this is a huge social issue, but again, we refuse to accept that it's somebody else's job to fix. So we're just starting to go, and we've got rich studies, we've got a whole network of women who are developing the policies, but we're radically changing how we approach different phases in a person's career so that people who make a variety of life choices can still consistently contribute. Because we find if we can make that happen, people want to continue to be a part of it. And then we don't have the same um, uh, attrition rate that we'd seen before. But the second most important thing is to get after the current managers on that hiring attitude. Because people will hire as birds of a feather. You're comfortable with people you know or they look like you. You have got to drive that out of the system by having a, a scientifically driven and carefully managed hiring approach. If you do those two things, I think you can, I don't know if you can get to where it's completely equal. I'm dreaming that you can, and why not try? But that's the two things we're thinking about a lot. Yes? Uh, you you'd mentioned earlier that uh, you and your son kind of had a different idea of how you wanted to change the world on the individual <laughs> level versus on a bigger scale. What do you think are the key personality differences that lead to those two different avenues? Yeah, I think, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one of the biggest differences between Jack and myself that I notice, anyway, is that Jack um, gets his satisfaction um, in, re he gets thoroughly satisfied by very small successes. So when a kid, you know, if he can get a kid across the finish line to his diploma or his GAD, he, if, if he can get one out of 10, he is electric. Because the failure rate's higher than that. We need to be clear, these are kids who judges have told, finish your degree or you're going to the big house. That these are the kind of kids he's teaching. Failure rate's unspeakable, right? These kids are in tough shape. And, and so he, if he has that one victory, it makes up for the failures, it gives him energy, he's right back at it. I couldn't live with a success rate like that. It would kill me. It just, for some reason, I'm wired different. The second thing is, and this is a sick thing that I admit about myself, but recognition is a fuel for me. I, I, I don't mind if people say I've done a good job. I, it's a little embarrassing to have that whole, I gotta get that fixed, I don't know who gave you that, but, um, but you know, the, the, that's a little embarrassing, but, but the basic, I, and so scale and recognition is really makes a difference to me. The third thing is Jack really, he really finds that intricate challenge of unlocking a kid who's, who's not had a good experience and is really going on the wrong way. He, he wants to get way into the weeds until he can find that trigger point that sets that kid on the right path. And that just brings him such joy that he will work so hard that he exhausts himself. I, 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 when, if you give me a, a five hour meeting on great detail, I'll probably see it at the beginning and I'll probably wake up again about right five minutes before the end. You know? Now the people around me are really good at that, thank goodness, but you gotta know who you are and what, you're, what you contribute. And we're just wired different when it comes to those things. But those are the big things I think about. Thanks. Anything else? I have an insurance question. Yes. Uh, I'm so glad we don't sell consumer insurance because usually this is where I get the question. The audience, I have a bad claim with you guys. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> the industry seems to be very challenged by the bond market. Yes. Is um, how do you see that going forward? What's your, what's your thinking on the future of, you know, when you sit at your board table? Uh, is it a challenge to you, and what do you see as the future? So that's a great question. So the observation was that the in our industry, insurance industry is very challenged by the bond market, in essence, by the interest rate environment. Um, because if you think about insurance, right, um, we have two big sources of revenue. One is underwriting profit, so that means that I create a pool of like risks, and you pay me each a little bit, and that whole pool experiences losses, who knows what losses, and then we might make money on that alone, right? So we might, and we, in our industry, that's called the combined ratio. I take in a dollar, how much do I pay out in losses and expenses? When the combined ratio is above 100, I'm losing money. When it's below 100, I'm, if it's 98, I've made two cents on every dollar. That's underwriting profit. But the other side of the balance sheet is our investment portfolio, which is why the bond market matters so much. The investment portfolio is very large 
not because we have so much capital, though that's part of it, but also because we, have, we get to hold the money for future losses, right? Because losses happen over many years on any insurance policy. So we hold that money. Warren Buffett refers to it float. That's why he loves the insurance industry. He gets all that float, and he can manage that money. And so if, if one income stream is, is your underwriting and the other is your investment income, because we're making promises that we had to hold capital for, the regulators require that we hold it in very vanilla instruments. We can't go out and be wildly speculative or that money would go away, right? So as a result, we're extremely interest rate sensitive because a huge portion. So at Excel, see our, our, our current investment portfolio is about $38 billion, of which about $29 billion is held in, in US government instruments generally or the gilt or whatever. So, so we're extremely sensitive to interest rates because that's where bond prices come from. And uh, the fact is right now, uh, our reinvestment rate, I believe right now is about 1.7%. So on all that capital, we get 1.7%, which is hardly anything. So in other words, we'd better be really good at underwriting right now or we can't make a profit. So in a, now, now it's different for the life insurance industry, but in the property and casualty insurance industry, this means underwriting is king. It's the only path to profit. You can't chase yield, it'll drive you off a cliff or your regulator will stop you. You have to do it on the underwriting side. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you have to be extremely adept at predicting how interest rates will move over time. Because when you price your product, you have to price it to what you think the average interest rate will be over the 30 years of exposure you might have. Well, so is our interest rates gonna go up? Are they gonna go up soon, not soon? All of these assumptions affect what you charge for price and then in turn affect um, how much you hold in reserves for future losses because it depends on how it compounds. When interest rates are this low and when we're in a historical environment we've never seen, literally never seen, our guidance to our underwriters is priced to the current environment and reserved to the future environment. And therefore we have a natural healthy hedge. That's very hard to do because then you have to sell against people who may be less disciplined. But that's how we handle it at our company. The life insurers are in a much tougher situation and therefore the society is in a much tougher situation because when we think about pension liabilities and these kinds of interest rates, the ability of societies on these kinds of interest rates to provide for their, their aging populations, it's almost impossible. And I, I think if, if, if you were to ask me what is the least talked about and most important political issue in the world, it's the funding of pension liabilities, whether it's Social Security or anything else, because we are lying to ourselves, the system is not generating enough income, and people are gonna live longer. And that is a horrible equation over time for how the elderly are gonna live decent lives. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I managed to work in a team before where everybody had a fancy title. They were either assistant director, regional director, uh, associate director, that was actually my favorite. <laughs> um, and everybody was empowered to be a leader. And the main problem is, uh, was that we could not actually have anybody to follow. You know, it came to the line, down the line where uh, there was a competition who actually literally stabbed the other one in the back to take the credit for achievements. And uh, if you had experience with these, and then what was the outcome? Yeah, I've seen a lot of these models. First of all, um, titles are often, so everybody heard that question, you know, when you have these kind of weird titles and you, you try and have that low hierarchical environment, sometimes they can wind up quite rudderless. You know, where's the leader and who steps forward and how do we, you know, I've seen this a couple of times. One thing, titles are hilarious to me because people are really fixated on titles, you know, and understandably, it's a point of pride, it's self-esteem, that's cool, those are motivating things. Um, but, but from a company's perspective, you know, there's nothing cheaper than giving away a title. You know, unless there's a handbook that says what comes with it, hey, you can put 20 words on that card, I could care less, you know, as long as you're doing something useful. Um, so, so, car, so titles are often used as psychic energy to give rewards without giving money, to be clear. Um, the, the, the second thing I observed, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of really, really interesting work, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of it's being done right here at Notre Dame, but there's really interesting work going on around organizational design. You know, we're in a totally, totally inventive, innovative culture, right? 
if you just think about the rate of change that's going on, how many things are being invented every day. This is, a, this is an era of radical invention. All the money is slipping to those categories, right? Which is leaving behind less money for teachers and for the, and and people were finding, you know, having had no military experience because it used to be everybody came out of the military, so everybody was used to yes sir no sir you know, you get out of that world and no one has any experience with that, so tell me how this works how do I motivate a genius, and get them to work well and play with others. That is really hard work. Now how do I find jobs for everybody in this room? when the rich are gonna keep getting richer and richer and richer, when the poor will probably be a shrinking category depending on how you define poverty, but the middle class is gonna find it hard to find work because machines are gonna do a lot of the work. These are the kinds of questions that lead you to amazing challenges in organizational design, personal esteem, and personal motivation. Today, usually if you have a group, you'll find a leader because someone's got the personality to pick up the mantle, but tomorrow, I'm. I'm seriously worried about how that's going to happen. I'm seriously worried about how we're going to create equity in society. I know that there's a lot of great professors in this world thinking about that really hard, but to me, it's it's about as big as it gets. How do you, how, you know, I, I strongly suspect that cavemen didn't have big self-esteem issues about going to work because they needed to kill something to eat. So they were still working very low on the hierarchy of needs. And then we made, it's a cultural thing, back to culture, we made work a cultural reward. Proud to go to work. I work hard. Well, there's not gonna be enough jobs for everybody. That world is coming. I bet you guys live in it. Well, that's an interesting thing. What's the new culture gonna be? What's the new reward system gonna be? I think that's, you know, to me, the, the, the group idea, I've seen that happen, usually a leader steps up. The world we're coming to? Not sure. Listen, you guys have been very, very patient. Uh, I don't know the exact time we're supposed to end, and I can't see a clock anywhere. Um, you want to tell me? Are we done, or do we have time for one more? Okay, please. Uh, with the recent challenges in the politi political spectrum, such as Brexit, or if you talk about Charlotte most recently, I'm just interested. Your your talk was very predicated on the idea of diversity. How can business work to mend those gaps, both internationally and domestically? Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, it is a, a fascinating time. Um, and I'll, I'll just make a couple comments that relate to how, first of all, I stand in the same place I did on gender. We don't have to wait to be told we have a role to play. This, this is not, it's not good enough to watch it go on. Uh, so when we talk about diversity and inclusion, well, we have an emphasis on gender because we have a particular problem in gender, it covers all aspects of diversity. In the United States, we've long had serious, I mean, my view of the race issues that we're experiencing right now is it feels entirely familiar. In 1968, this was the same, I was watching the same stuff. And we saw a brief boomlet of it in the Rodney King killings in LA, and now we're in a big systemic event like 1968 where about half of America's inner cities were on fire. So each of these appears to be a period of awakening. I know the woke is a big word these days, but it appears to be a, a period of social awakening where we realize, you know, guys, there are still really deeply broken things and it ain't getting better fast enough and I won't wait any longer. And then it opens a the opportunity for, not, not necessarily it will have, but the opportunity for a more genuine conversation. And the problem I have with this is that the voices get so loud and everybody gets so boxed in that you can't move, you know? You just shout at each other. And we're in that phase right now, I think. Where we have to get to is honest dialogue about there are real problems <clears throat> and there are real balances we have to find and how are we gonna do it together, gang? And, and there will be voices that will emerge. They can't do it in the angry phase. They're forged by the angry phase, but they emerge next. That happened in the Civil Rights Commission in the 60s, which was, a response, was part of the response to the rioting. And there was progress made, but not nearly sufficient when we see the outrages we see today. But in, in a society where, where it is true that some people with their hands up are getting shot unarmed, and in a society where cops are getting killed who are generally there to defend, we've got a lot wrong. 
And the real conversation, I think, is next to happen. In companies, as in the army in the, in the 40s, you know, companies and the army have always been integration forces within society. Because if we're built right, we don't give a dang what color you are, where you're from, what you're living. That stuff is so irrelevant to us. If you're good at making us money, we're going to hire you. We, we don't, we could care less. And then we got to work on our managers to make sure some hidden biases aren't getting in the way of that idea. We are a force for integration. And many companies have done wonderful things in that regard. We got to step it up. But the conversation that happens next to me is the big moment. It'll be the, it'll be the first time in, in my life in 40 years or so that we're going to have to have an urgent dialogue about the state of race in America. And we should not waste this opportunity. It has been bloodily won. And we better really set all the junk out of the room and talk with some real urgency and honesty. But it's going to take a little while. It's going to, you have to get past the screaming phage to get to the hard work. Thank you for asking. All right, gang, thank you very, very much, and have a great day.